And he said, you might want to see my teacher. Oh, who's that? Sal Salvador. And Sal was a name really from the 40s, 50s, and 60s. He used to play a lot of big band stuff. Mm -hmm. And he was the strictest of all of my teachers. Mm -hmm. he, um, he'd go Without through, the ruler, though. Without the ruler, exactly. <laughs> he had a sense of humor. Um, but, you know, you go through a whole set of scales, and if you hit the next to the wrong note, next to the last note wrong, right, start again. Mm -hmm. So you really have to then, you know, work on getting your chops, your technique, yeah. really understanding how, how the parts of your body that serve to function, to play the instrument, work best. Sure, yeah. And I've been able to synthesize all three of these teachers now into... When I teach, I use some of their materials, I use their, mm -hmm. some of their actual teaching books and, and sayings that sort of become um, de rigueur. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's, I've read this line in half a dozen music books. Start practicing slowly. Mm -hmm. The speed will come on its own. And sure enough, that's true. You can't just start trying to be, you know, um, Alvin Lee, mm. or, or, you know, or... Thank you very much, Dean. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you got to start slow, and, and as you progress, your finger, mu your, your muscles, yeah. you know, become more attuned to what you want to do, and sure. it's great. So, there I was, loaded up with three great teachers. By the time I was 12, I knew that I wanted to be a guitar player. But, you know, the idea of following your dream is what I keep really preaching to anybody who will listen. Yeah. You know, if you really think that you can do something that's perhaps out of the ordinary sure. and out of off the beaten path, pursue it. Worst comes to worst, you learn another set of skills or you already will have. Sure. And you can either fall back on them and or learn them and do whatever else you gotta do to keep a roof over your head and keep your family fed and sure. all that stuff. Do you have any advice for uh, anyone who might entertain the idea of following that dream of being a musician, guitar player, today? I mean, how do you sure. see it differently um, and how do you see that path to success that's okay. quite a bit different than yours it would have to be now? Indeed, right? indeed. It, what was once difficult has become close to impossible. The way the music industry, not the music, but the industry has restructured itself is such that the content creators, the mm. players, the writers, the singers, they're not making any sort of near the money that they would have made back in the good old days. It's terrible. Uh, I mean, it, it's, there's always been a, an element of thievery yeah, to sure, any yeah. business, but it's really gotten terrible. You know, you've got your streaming companies and, you know, rather than getting three cents on a, on a play on an FM radio station, you're getting point zero 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 six of a cent yeah. when somebody streams it. Well, and you've seen the whole arc from when it was run by a bunch of cigar-chopping fat cats to when the artists actually kind of took control and, you know, you rode that wave and now it's almost come back full circle. Indeed. In a sense, to, Indeed to where it, it was then. Yeah, but the thing is also you got to think out of the box. You have to think like not, oh, gee, what you know, what, what open mic jam can I get to? If you're just starting out, yeah, do the open mic jams. Do whatever you got to do. Even go on Spotify, which I do that too. Um, but that's me. You know, if you're looking to build an audience, do whatever you have to do, short of something that you know you're going to regret later on. Mm. Um, I like to tell young people to find ways to subsidize their recording. Mm. Now these days obviously for so easy. To yeah, do. I mean, just for like less than a thousand bucks. In some cases way less than a thousand bucks. You can put together a little home studio. Yeah. Start making demos. Um, if you and the more skilled you become with that, mm. then you have another another set of opportunities to fall back on. Sure. Because if you learn to become a recording engineer, boy that what fun that is. Oh yeah. my goodness. Well, and even the, you know, I think it's it's interesting because it's so much more convenient to record and, you know, less expensive and easier to record than it used to be, but yet you really don't see people 
manipulating it the same way. I mean, I, I think one thing that's interesting, you look at you look at a lot of bands that came up, like, you know, I don't, I don't know if, uh, if, if you listen to these guys, I'm sure you're, you're familiar with them, but um, I think a good example of it, there's a documentary on, on Kansas. You know, I was always a Kansas fan. We were on the same label. We were on Christmas Eve. Yeah, yeah. Well, they were nurtured, you know, and they did they did very little for three or four albums, and then they exploded. But mm. somebody believed in them, and somebody set them up and got them to that point, and there's just no mechanism for that to happen anymore. That's right. That's you right. know? There's very, very little. So you have to build your own audiences. Yeah, you have to do it because you love it. Really. Yeah. So how do you do it? You know, uh, I, I believe in, in, in sort of going the grassroots method, building your own audience. If you play in a little town in Ohio, mm. you know, keep playing that town till you got enough of an audience to where you know that you can move 20, 30 miles in any direction. Your fans mm. will follow you and you can start building up new fans. Mm -hmm. And the more new fans you can get, the better. Um, instead of do, playing the, the pay for play nightclubs, mm. you know, which I think are incredibly insulting, um, you can actually rent, uh, over here in England they have these things called um, little town halls, mm -hmm. or little WWI, Women's something or other institute uh, halls that'll, you know, for 50 bucks or 50 pounds, you can have the place for the night. Mm. And if you're dealing with, uh, you know, if you've got the right age group, you can also sell drinks. Mm. Here in England they have a thing called mm -hmm. sale and return. So you, yeah, can buy, why? you can buy 20, you know, cases of beer and whatever isn't open you can actually bring back to the merchant right. and, and get a full refund. Yeah. So you know you then wind up you can sell that you can obviously you want to sell your merch, you want to sell CDs or these days more you know you get these little USB bracelets because um, people don't even have CD players anymore do yeah, they? Yeah. Except for the older I do. the older ones. <laughs> yeah me too. I still buy them. <laughs> actually I like to have a hard copy. Yeah. Yeah, but, um, you know, find ways that aren't the ordinary, mm. where you can keep developing a fan base. And that's live, them. that's one of the few things you still really have control over. Sure. Directly, you sure. Know, touring, money yeah. and... And if you don't live in the city, if you live in the country, you know, there's farms all over the place. Mm. Surely there'll be a farmer someplace who's willing to do, not Woodstock, mm. but maybe mini Woodstock, you know, get three or four bands together, uh, rent the place for a day or two days, True, yeah. and just have kids come and, you know, pay a reasonable admission fee. Mm -hmm. And two things happen. One of them is you get a chance to perform. Mm -hmm. The kids get to see, to see you know, performers. Mm -hmm. If you can get three or four bands, then each band has its own following. Yeah. And what you're doing is you're cross-pollinating. You know, people might have come to see Band A, but they also like Band C, or mm -hmm. Band C and Band D. So, all of a sudden, you know, they have new people they like, the band's got a, a, a larger audience, yeah. and there's ways around the system. Well, and there, it does seem like, like, you know, kind of an offshoot of that. One of the things that, uh, you know, it seems to be growing, or, or at least sustaining, is the festival scene. Mm. You know, I mean, there's a lot of these festivals, you know, and they pop up every year, a new festival. Absolutely. And, you know, like a lot of the people I end up talking to at door shows and things are, you know, they're doing that festival. Yeah. So, so, so that means along, that, right? but that also brings up another small kettle of fish, which is how do you get onto the festivals. Yeah, yeah. And that's about networking. It's about finding the people who are booking the festivals, mm. uh, finding new musicians who have connections. Mm. It's all, it's, it's a very social, or it should be, a very social scene mm. where um, people can, in the best way, take advantage of their relationships with one mm. another. I believe the term is enlightened self-interest. Well, it's a, you know, it's, it should be synergistic, too, you know, I mean, you're of course. helping each other out. I mean, that's one thing, you know, as a, as a company we always try to do, and like that artist company relationship should be both ways, you know, I mean, Something like this. I'm, I'm, you know, yeah. I mean, I'm getting more out of it than you are, I'm hey, sure. But everybody wins. I'm putting you out there too, right? In a sense, absolutely. I mean, and maybe absolutely. You, you know, it's it's a drop in the bucket, but uh, for us, it's it's no, like it's the great. whole bucket. <laughs> it's great. I mean, that that's part of what life's about. It's all about these little drops in the yeah. bucket, and you know, it's like making 
a color of paint. You know, yeah. you get a little green, a little blue, and the next thing you know, you go, whoa, this is really cool. Sure. So another piece of advice that I would give to anyone of any age is take care of your ears. Because if you don't, you're going to wind up with hearing aids or without them and everything's going to throw into a roof, which you don't want. Um, so it's pretty important to think about not just the moment, but your health and safety mm. throughout your life. Um, yeah, and even headphones and earbuds, I mean, people think they don't realize oh, indeed. Yeah, yeah. what they're doing. Well, I, having spent many, many years in the studios wearing earphones all the time, yeah. that just compounded the problem. Sure, yeah. And as time goes on throughout the day, you need more and more volume. Yeah. So the more and more volume, the more and more you're traumatizing the parts of your ear that matter. Yeah. The cochlea, the little hairs, you know, it, it's not a good thing. Um, so yeah, I mean, really being aware of the volumes with which you're playing and listening are incredibly important. Well, and I find, you know, I mean, I've been to a couple shows lately that were just too loud. I mean, it doesn't sound good. They have a tendency to do that when it's too loud. Yeah, that, I, that's I, why Night Bob yeah. is great. It is great because he actually it up. he understands yeah what the ceiling is. Sure, yeah. Um, other bands don't. I I played something a little while ago where um, I was really excited to get up and jam with the band for a couple of tunes and it was so loud. I mean, not only was the mot was the you know the front of house too mm. loud, but it was too loud on stage. Yeah. And where's the pleasure in playing if you really can't hear the subtleties yeah. of both your fellow musicians and yourself? So I take a 20-watt amp with me. I have this Hughes and Kettner 20-watt mm. amp. And when people say, turn up, I go, no, no, you turn down. Because I'm not going any louder yeah. than this. Well, and but the magic happens that way because then everybody hears the little subtleties. Yeah, absolutely. And it's beautiful. Well, and on the other side of it, you see a lot of bands like, you know, the Doobie Brothers, which you 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 know, you're friends with. and We had the best with. sound ever. Well, they're, you know, these days they have their amps on the stage and they're all using in-ears and, mm -hmm. you know, it just gets, everybody yeah. can hear what's going on. Better. Well, back in the mid-70s, yeah, I mean, when I was playing with them, we basically had small speaker sections facing us mm -hmm. on the stage and that was it obviously yeah. the heads in the back so we can control but the the actual levels on the stage were very very civil yeah. and it allowed the front of house engineer since he had much less bleed yeah. to make mixes that rivaled if not bettered the records sure yeah so you well know, there's even a better ability to do that now i mean you know back in the day it was like big amps and I mean now it's like the trend is more towards 10, 15, you know, 20 watt amps that you can yeah. crack yeah. and get that if you need that sound of hot tubes. Absolutely. You don't have to have a wall of Marshall stacks to get it anymore, you know. Yeah. And, and most bands are, you know, they've got a little amp mic and they've got a fake wall of Marshall cabinets indeed, on the stage. Indeed, indeed. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Which is Spinal Tap too, but you know, I mean, you got to you got to walk the walk, I guess, too, you know? Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, the show business is an important part of show sure, business. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> Obviously, I guess, right? Yeah, but... But, yeah. no, it comes down to the sound. I mean, it's it's the sound, ultimately. Absolutely. Right? I mean, that's what it's all about. That's what Absolutely. people want to hear, literally. Is. Yeah. Yeah. We tried to produce our own record, and that was when I learned that sometimes self-production is not a good idea. Mm -hmm. There's five guys who are producing ourselves which means there's ten hands on the recording mm -hmm. console at all times. Once the but you needed ten hands, hands sometimes back then, because well, you didn't have no, the automation. No that's right, that's <laughs> right. But this, this wasn't one of those things, it just didn't work. So I decided it was time to go back to New York. Mm -hmm. uh, I left the band. Interesting story here. When I left, I gathered everybody up to say goodbye. And I said, you know, you guys, I love you, I think you're great. You need to find a producer. You need to find one person who mm -hmm. can say, from the top of the ladder, this is how I see it, and mm -hmm. this is what I want to do. And I said, really? Mm. Who do you suggest? And I said, well, off the top of my head, how about George Martin? Mm. And they looked at me like I'd completely lost it. <laughs> I go back to New York, four or five months later, 
comes word that George Martin is producing Sea Train. So they just called him? They did. Uh, what do you got to lose? Yeah, you might as well, right? Yeah. Just yeah, ask. Him and ask. You might get a yes. Yeah. This is there's proof right here. Life comes with all these, you know, choices yeah. and sometimes conflicting opportunities. And you can only take your best guess. Um, it's a double edged sword. It is. It is indeed. Kings. Kings. I like Kings. Um, I didn't know that was you actually growing up. All right. Uh, you're well, one of my I, favorite I, solos. The thing I love about that solo is that, first of all, it was a weird song. Mm. It had strange changes, yeah. it had strange subject matter. But I was in the middle of life turmoil. I was going mm. through a divorce from a, you know, a, a young marriage that I really should never have gotten into. Mm. So I was bananas. And I got a chance to play out my mm. bananasness on on that thing. You know, and you also got a chance to pick your app. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, it, you know, I, I remember doing some some regular rock stuff and then all of a sudden going into like a whole tone descending. <laughs> so I got a chance to be schizophrenic on a record. Which was fun. And it's I learned record. that... Well, you know, I mean, th what it taught me was that let it all hang out. Mm. Worst comes to worst, it'll be a solo that doesn't work. Mm. Best comes to best, it's like people go, where did that come from? Yeah, yeah. So, and I love the idea of not being ordinary. Um, how can you take some, un unless the remit of the record is to sound absolutely ordinary. Mm. But the idea of taking chances, making an adventure out of the whole mm. scene, that's, that's the stuff. Yeah. When, when I do a solo, Unless I'm instructed to play certain notes in a certain mm. fashion, I don't think about it. Mm. I let it come through me. Mm. And I don't mean to get all like spiritual and stuff, but yeah. Well, it's obviously colored by your knowledge. Knowledge and experience, do, sure, yeah. sure. But then you go, okay, where do I go from here? Well, okay, maybe I'll just, you know, yeah. and you just let the spirit take you. Yeah, it's great. And then you listen back and say, where did that? Well, you li I never played that before. Well, indeed. In fact, that brings to mind something else that people might want to take heed of, which is that if you're not a professional gigging musician and you want to up your game, I always recommend to my students, make sure you have some sort of piece of music so recording software so that mm. they can hear what you play. Mm. The way I was able to improve my technique and my approach was by being in the studio, listening to playbacks, and mm. you get instant feedback. You hear exactly what you did. You know that sometimes you think you did something genius, mm. and it winds up being, ooh. Yeah, yeah. Other times you wind up thinking, that was pretty, eh. And you go, fuck, that was great. Right. That works. Yeah. yeah. So you, you never know. But the way to sort of know is by auditing yourself, listening mm. to what you're playing with yeah, various Yeah, be self-critical. Yes. Yes, absolutely. As well. Yeah. Um, well, and again, that's so much easier to do these days. You know, of and course you can set yourself up with. You know, really, all you need is a is a is a USB box. You yeah. Know, and then you, know, you get the software with it a lot of times. I mean, what I use for recording demos is, I mean, it's it's like two hundred dollars worth of gear, basically. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Not, it doesn't have to be expensive. Yeah. You know, of course, I'm just doing minimal instrumentation, so you sure. need more if you need to. Get a whole band recorded at the same yeah, time. Yeah, but if you want to do it, for, have to be if you want to do it for yourself, there's plenty of freeware yeah. out there as well. Yeah, there's a program called Audacity. Yeah, I use that a lot. Which actually. works cross-platform. Yeah. It's on Macs, it's on yeah. PCs. It's wonderful. Yeah, yeah I kind of use that for you know mastering. Yeah, basically, you know. All right. Yeah. What I also wanted to talk about in terms of guitars and ways to get again out of the box, if mm -hmm. you will, is and thanks to Roy Smek, my my second teacher, you mm -hmm. know who taught me, one of the first things he taught me, okay, how do I delight this kid? Well, he took his bottom two strings, mm. twisted them around each other and say, here you go, kid, here's a snare drum. <laughs> right? like, wow. Which brings to, you know... I've and, never and, seen that, actually. Well, a lot I've of never heard about to do it. Yeah. And then, of course, you have harmonics, which mm. are much more common. Mm. And how to manipulate those sounds mm -hmm. in different ways. What about some of like the, and this is something I, you know, I mean, I guess I should have realized, but mm -hmm. some of those in-between 
you know, like the like the like the fifth harmonics that are actually not sitting right on top of frets. Do you use those? Sometimes. Those much? Yeah. yeah if the spirit. I always forget where they are. Yeah, <laughs> no, the spirit just grabs me every <laughs> now and again. But knowing, for example, on an offender guitar, if you play behind the nut, you mm -hmm. have a D. Oh, this isn't a fender, sorry. If it was a fender, oh, yeah, you get. Um, be a guiro, take your pick, turn it the other way so it doesn't ruin the pick, and go. You know. You're staying in the salsa vein, you can go. Become a conga drum. Mm -hmm. I did a record for Vicky Sue Robinson once called Turn the Beat Around, mm. which was later covered by Miami Sound Machine. Mm -hmm. And I used this really slow phaser. My entire part was doing this. Not playing a single tonal note, mm -hmm. but being the, another piece of the percussion. Sure, yeah. And there's nothing you can't do. You know, the back of my Strat obviously has the springs here. Yep. Sometimes I play the springs. Yeah. You know, I'll so are really here. good for picking up springs. Too, yeah. So. Yeah, I noticed. So, <laughs> sometimes it's bad. If you need to mute them, just just shove a paper towel behind them or something. Uh, but yeah, they are. They project a lot of mm. field. So uh, I get every once in a while I get a call from somebody. It's like I hear this ringing. It's driving me nuts. You know, I was like, oh, it's your springs. Just I'm like, oh, okay. But no, it's not obvious. In fact, it took me a while to. Sure. Sure. I was hearing it for a few yeah. months. So like, but that's like, part of the that? beauty of sentence X coil are that they're very sensitive to yeah. all of the frequencies that are going on around them. Yeah. And um, I'd much rather have that than something that was less sensitive. Sure. They're lively. I think lively is a good yeah. way to, yeah, responsive. to put it. Yeah. 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 And, you know, you have to be careful. It's, you know, you pick up what you're playing, you got to be careful the noise you make because it's coming through. Absolutely. Whether you like it or not, you know, Absolutely. And, and sometimes uh, maybe it's not a good noise. <laughs> I do have a funny Robbie Robertson <laughs> story, though, for you. <laughs> Robbie was the guitar player with the band, and um, I was a bit shy, and he was a bit shy. And I remember going over and I'll make a little small talk. So, Robbie, how often do you change your strings? And he looked at me with a complete straight face, mm. and didn't miss a beat, and went, when I break one. Mm. <laughs> That's true. And with me, I mean, I've spent pieces of my life, especially when you're out on the road, you know, and you got a, a whole crew and you got a guitar tech and this and that. I'd have my strings changed every show. Sure, yeah. Because you, know? you get the most zing for them. Yeah, I hate breaking strings. In yeah. The the song, too. But now, to be honest, you know, with the string manufacturer has improved a lot. Uh, this whole cryogenics thing, some people poo poo it. I'm very impressed. I've yet to have one There's break. microstructural uh, changes. Sure. In the, Physics. In the metal, which, yeah. right? I mean, there's things yeah. that happen. Yeah, but I put these strings on like months ago. Yeah. And, yeah. All right, well, maybe I can give you a trick. You know what my trick is? If I don't feel like changing, I spray a little WD-40 on a paper towel, and I wipe it until it stops singing. So when there's grit on there, it'll go and you just clean it until it, it stops making that noise. I'm going to try that. It works. Try it out there. It works. This man knows so what he's talking about. Just don't get it out of the way. It's, it's, it's actually fish oil based, which is something I didn't realize. WD-40, you know, I always thought it was a nasty chemical. It's basically well, it, it's funny the, things, you, the things that you learn as, mm -hmm. as you grow up. I mean, with me, I was always big into like, I'm going to use lemon oil to polish my guitar. Mm -hmm. And I remember my luthier laughing at me when they said, it's only good for one thing, Elliot. What's that? He said, rosewood necks. Mm. He said, the rest of it, use a spray or anything mm. else you want. It's not going to make any difference to the, the wood or how long it lasts or anything. Mm -hmm. But rosewood necks really love genuine lemon, lemon oil. Mm. Just put it on, let it sink in for the night, and mm -hmm. you know, come back the next day, you'll be laughing. Mm. And I am, always. You know. Cool. Tips, tips and tricks. Just part of the fun. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Oh, yeah. another good tip and trick is that use your ears. When you're tuning your instrument, for example, you can get lazy and use a tuner. Sometimes I do. And if you're on stage, obviously, using an electronic tuner can be very, very beneficial and, you know, quick. Um, having said that, um, there's nothing like um, the real deal. Mm.
I mean, what was it for you? Was there one thing that you said, I want to do that, that's, there, that's there were, cool. Funny enough, there were dozens. Um, growing up watching TV. Well, and obviously it was uh, pre-Beatles, because well, you were already that's fired. Right, that's right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they had all those Western shows, and the mm -hmm. Western shows had all these twangy guitars, mm -hmm. which were a lot of Tommy Tedesco and a couple yeah, of yeah. guys. Um, and Did you end up knowing Tommy at all in your... Uh, yeah, we, yeah, later on, I mean, yeah. way, way yeah. later on, toward the end of his career, actually. Uh, funny guy, yeah. really funny guy. But um, aside from those, there was a show called The Lawrence Welk Show. Yeah. And they had two really, really, really yeah. great guitar players. Mm. Um, Neil Levang and the other name will come back to me. Mm. We we'll put it up on the mm. subtitle. Sure, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, they were, they were playing some unbelievably hip stuff. Mm. And then the Beatles came out mm. and just uh, reinforced it, probably. Yeah, yeah. So but around, I'm on the right track because those guys got it. Mm. Yeah, but within a couple of years of that, I was also listening to. I was never really a jazz. I wasn't a mm. bebopper. I still aren't because it's a lifetime study. Um, Having said that, I, I listened to a lot of Jimmy Smith, mm. and Kenny Burrell was his guitar player, was fantastic. Mm. Um, but in terms of the growing up and, you know, the things that made me go boing, mm. um, my mom took me to see, within about a two-year period, Andres Segovia, mm. and also Car Carlos Montoya, mm. and then finally Manitas de Plata, mm -hmm. who was a gypsy, is mm. a, a gypsy guitarist, absolutely mm. phenomenal, flamenco. Mm. Um, and it, it's been said that, well, he's a bit sloppy. Well, so what? You know, the fact is the it's emotion is so there. Mm. It's like, it, that's just unbelievable. Yeah. So those three guys, mm -hmm. Dwayne Eddy was a big influ influence, The mm. Ventures. Mm. Um, some of the telly players, you know, mm. the Roy Buchanan's and those yeah, guys. Sure, yeah. Um, but geez, there's, there's always been so much to listen to. It's just a quest. It's a question of, you know, how plugged in you are to what's going on. Can your friends turn you on to other things? Mm. But all yeah, well, that's a good. So you know, we uh, you talked a little bit, um, you know, you and I off camera mm. about. Uh, you know, Hendrix, um, mm -hmm. Page. Yeah. Um, I mean, you were peers yeah, yeah, with yeah. these guys in real time when it was happening, right? I mean, yeah. what what did you get? What did you get from those guys? I mean, did you get anything from Jimmy? Is there anything specific? Did you teach anything to Jimmy? Did he get anything from you? No, we did both. We, Jimmy or? and I both shared a love of Curtis Mayfield. Oh, cool. And if you listen to a lot of Jimmy's stuff, and probably a lot of my stuff as well, mm. you'll hear Curtis Mayfield, you know, coming through laughing, you know, mm. once or twice a tune. He was so plugged in musically, harmonically, spiritually. Yeah, and yeah. It was really just all there. Well, and I heard you doing some stuff earlier, like kind of, uh, you know, I'm not even sure what the right term for it is, but kind of arpeggiating off of the chord forms kind of thing that Jimmy did a lot. And when I... For me, that was really a personal revelation. It really mm. opened up my playing a lot when I figured that out. Yeah. I mean, is that did that come from Curtis Mayfield? Absolutely, absolutely, hundred percent. Mm. Yeah. Cool. And who knows who Curtis got it from? Sure. Yeah, it's right. funny because when I from the best, right? Yeah. yeah well, from the best, absolutely. Yeah. Um, when I do my workshops and you know master classes and stuff, one of the things that I do is ask the young guitar players, right? Well, who who do you listen to? Who's mm. who's your biggest influence? And everybody will come up with somebody. Mm. And then I'll choose somebody and say, okay, well, who do you think their influence was? Mm. And usually there's like a minute of a blank stare, a blank yeah. stare, and then a light bulb goes off. Yeah, yeah. And then people start understanding that it goes back and sure, back yeah. and back. And that's, it worked that way with the classical composers as well. You know, so yeah. th there's something to be gleaned from everything. When I hear somebody say, I don't listen to anybody because I'm too original. Mm. I go, mm -hmm. well, that means you're not really loading up okay, your Okay, I think our time's about up. <laughs> right. I've always been bothered by pickups that hum. Mm. So while I do recognize that a P90 has its own distinct sound mm. and is great, mm. I know that they also produce a lot of noise. They hum like crazy. Yeah.
Now, I was okay with my Stratocaster for a while, even though it, it hummed, mm -hmm. you know, or buzzed, whatever you want to call it. You know, and of course, the worse the lighting conditions were, the, more, the louder the buzz got. Um, and then in 69, I, I transitioned to a humbucker in the neck position of my Strat. Absolutely loved it. Um, I went through a number of other different guitars mm. over the years. You know, I had I had, I had a telecat, I had a um, Jazzmaster, mm -hmm. which frankly the pickups didn't leave me feeling particularly great. Mm. Having said that, opinions are like navels. Everybody's got one, mm. so I wouldn't I say. It differently. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I would never ever say to somebody, oh no, that pickup really sucks. If you like it, then it's mm. got a reason for being. Well, there's no, so, you know, it's all preference. Anyway, right? There's no right answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, I, I then went to, uh, well, the Strat having been my number one guitar forever, mm. um, I decided to then change the middle pickup to a stacked humbucker, which didn't leave me feeling particularly great. Mm -hmm. And it was two or three years ago that we met, and I tried this X coil, and it just blew my brains away. It was it was everything that I'd looked for in a pickup. That is to say, it was warm, it was crystalline and sharp, and it had a, a lovely mid-range frequency as well, set of frequencies. So the whole uh, the graph of frequencies, if mm. you will, felt more complete to me than virtually every other pickup. Well, and we're talking about a SP5 Plus, which I think, you know, especially in the context of the lower output, kind mm -hmm. of more stratty stuff that we've introduced in the, in the Z-Core uh, mm -hmm. 5 series, you know, really, it's kind of a hybrid. It's kind of like right in between, smack in between a humbucker and a conventional, you know, kind of low output 50s yeah. single coil. Well, it works great. It yeah. works absolutely great. Um, can yeah, we use it a lot as a bridge pickup, actually. You, you've got it in the middle. Yeah. I'll have to try one as a bridge yeah, pickup. Pretty well, well, we, we could do that. Okay. We could, we'll do whatever you want. Cool. Cool. Um, yeah, I mean, there's... There's so many different ways to make sounds, mm. you know. And the pickup is just really one of the most important parts, mm. and it's coming from the source. Mm. You know, you get your strings are oscillating, and what do they do? They talk to the magnetic pickups, mm. which in turn send the signals to the amplifier and the speakers. The speakers oscillate. Mm. One of Jimmy's, you know, number one traits was understanding, not on a technical level, but on a spiritual level, for lack of a better word. Visceral level. Yeah, certainly, mm -hmm. yeah. He, he knew how to combine oscillations. Mm. He could, he knew that if he made a certain note feedback, mm. he could play with that note by the proximity factor. Mm. Wherever he was in relation to the speakers, if he brought it closer, mm. it would be stronger. If he tilted it one way or another, it might actually change the overriding principal harmonic. Mm. So he could go from a tonic to a fifth, but if he went another way, it might go to like a completely different, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, uh, uh, a seventh or, mm. or, you know, or, 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 or even, you name it. It, mm. it. it would just go there because of the way yeah, yeah. he was moving the parts. Yeah. And of course, guitars weren't meant, they weren't designed to do that. So it, what it meant is that he was taking it to a whole other level. Mm. He was taking the design and then co-opting that design to get mm. the sounds that he wanted. Sure, yeah. Well, and that's actually, um, I have another question I'll try to remember later, mm. but while we're on that, um, yeah, I mean, so, you know, certainly Hendrix was a pivotal moment, like a watershed oh, kind of okay. guy. I mean, what, what do you see as, as the most significant events in um, guitar history, rock music history. Oh, that's, that's interesting. It, it, it would have to do with styles, mm. with um, 
stylistic approaches to mm. the guitar. You know, you get the conventional approach, which mm. is fingers, a pick or your fingers on the right hand or on the, on the picking hand, um, through to people using strange devices like, uh, what's that little guy? Ebo. Ebo, yeah. yeah. Which, when used creatively, can come out with some really mm. fantastic stuff. Um, at the same time, you've got the slide. Mm. You know, I think somebody like Ry Cooter. When mm. I heard Ry Cooter, I went, <gasps> Do you play much slide? I don't know if I can think of you. Not enough. Nothing I've heard that you play not enough. slide. You talked about lap steel. Do you, do you play lap steel? Not really. No. Mm. Not really. I mean, the guitar has, has really been the one mm. six string instrument that I really play, sure. or you know, multi string instrument that I play well. Mm. Um, I play a little bit of bass, but. Mm. The, the focus is on a little bit. Mm. Um, Do you play piano? I don't know. Very badly. Mm. I love synthesis. I, love, piano, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, love, I love working with oscillators and yeah. see how oscillators can be used to affect each other. Sure. Using different waveforms, um, you know, having, having an oscillator work as a low frequency oscillator, mm. having, having others work as frequency controls. Mm you know, for Q, and it, it's just, mm. there's no limit, you mm. know, it's, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm one of the original guys who said, mm, why don't I try using brushes on a telephone book, let's see mm. what that sounds like, mm. you know, when it comes to production. It's like, you're, you're limited only by your imagination. Well, we have one of our, uh, I don't know if you know, uh, Carl, one of our, one of our, uh, you know, actually closest friends uh, in this business and a uh, really good endorser and supporter is a uh, guy named Carl Harvey. Mm -hmm. Plays uh, guitar with uh, Toots and the Maytals. Oh wow! Fantastic. In fact, he's uh, he's has developed and has, is uh, marketing a uh, he calls it the Rastacasta. So it's kind of a Strat, um, uh, you know, inspired I think guitar seen... with the with the color. Yes, I've seen that actually. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and in fact, it was really hard to get the right colors on the on the pickup covers. I bet. Yeah. Yeah. Looks yeah. great though when we finally got it. I tell you what, I did do. Uh, a really good reggae version of I Shot the Sheriff the other night. Oh, cool. And oh, at the Thursday? At the yeah, show? yeah. And I tell you what, it was his ex club. Oh, cool. It really made it. It just cool. really cut through. Yeah, well, that's a good tone for that, you know, to... Yeah. Oh, yeah.